book one chapter twenty eight of the mystical city of god volume two by the venerable sister mary of jesus of agreda this librivox recording is in the public domain book one chapter twenty eight lucifer with all his seven legions persists in tempting most holy mary she conquers the dragon and crushes his head even if the prince of darkness and wickedness had now retreated his exorbitant pride would have been sufficiently discomfited and humiliated by the victories which had been gained by the queen of heaven but as even if vanquished he continues to rise up against god with insatiable malice he did not acknowledge his defeat psalm seventy three verse twenty three finding himself conquered and conquered so completely by an apparently insignificant and weak woman though he and his hosts had overcome so many valiant men and high-minded women his fury raged onward though in smothered flames of wrath god had permitted the enemies to become aware of the pregnancy of the most holy mary though leaving them under the impression that it was entirely a natural process for the divinity of the child and other mysteries connected with it always remain hidden to these enemies hence they persuaded themselves that this was not the promised messias since they held this child to be a man like the rest of the human race this error also confirmed them in the mistake that most holy mary was not the mother of the word genesis chapter three verse fifteen both of whom were to crush the head of the dragon yet they were persuaded that of a woman so valiant and victorious some man of distinguished sanctity would be born the great dragon convinced of this conceived against the fruit of the most holy mary that vast fury mentioned in the twelfth chapter of the apocalypse and referred to in this history and he awaited the birth of her son in order to devour him whenever lucifer directed his looks toward this child enclosed in the womb of the most holy mary he felt a mysterious power oppressing him although his presence seemed to cause only a certain weakening and deadening of his strength yet this was sufficient to enrage him and to make him seek by all means the destruction of this suspicious child and of his victorious mother assuming the most fearful shapes of fiercest bulls and terrible dragons or of other monsters he sought to approach her without ever being able to succeed he rushed upon her but found himself repulsed without knowing by whom or how he struggled like a wild beast in chains and gave forth awe-inspiring howls which if god had not prevented their being heard would have terrified the world and would have frightened many men to death he shot forth from his mouth fire and fumes of sulphur mixed with poisonous spittle all this the heavenly princess mary saw and heard without being moved more than if she saw a gnat he caused disturbances in the air upon the earth or in her house disarranging and overthrowing it in all its parts but most holy mary still remained unmoved retaining her inward and outward tranquillity and peace and showing herself invincibly superior to all his attempts lucifer finding himself thus vanquished opened his most impure mouth and set in motion his lying and defiled tongue he loosened the floodgates of his malice and spouted forth in the presence of the heavenly empress all the heresies and infernal falsehoods of the sex which he and his associates spread through the world for after they had been hurled from heaven and after they were informed that the divine word was to assume human flesh in order to be the chief of a race which he would replenish with graces and celestial teachings the dragon resolved to concoct falsehoods and heresies in opposition to all the truths concerning the knowledge love and worship of the most high in this occupation the demons consumed many years before the coming of christ the lord of the world and all this poisonous deceit lucifer the ancient serpent had stored up within himself now he poured it out in the presence of the mother of truth and purity hoping to infect her by all the falsehoods which he had conceived against the truth of god up to that day they are not fit to be described here even less so than some of the temptations indicated in the last chapter for it would be dangerous not only for the weak souls but even the strongest must fear the pestilential breath of lucifer who on this occasion exhaled all his deceitful malice according to what i saw i believe doubtlessly that there was no error idolatry or heresy 
known to have existed in the world to this day which this dragon did not vomit forth in the hearing of the sovereign mary therefore the church can truly congratulate mary on account of her victories affirming of her that she by herself had smothered and extinguished all the heresies of the whole world office of the blessed virgin mary thus in truth our victorious sulamite armed with her virtues advanced like an army in battle array canticles chapter seven verse one to confound overwhelm and destroy the infernal hosts all their falsehoods and each one in particular she refuted contradicting detesting and anathematizing all of them with invincible faith and sublime constancy she proclaimed the various truths opposed to his falsehoods magnifying the lord by means of them as true just and holy she broke out into songs of praise in which his virtues and doctrines were extolled as true holy immaculate and altogether praiseworthy in fervent prayer she besought the lord to humiliate the arrogance of the demons by preventing them from spreading so freely their poisonous errors through the world and asking him to diminish the influence of the false teachings which they had already sowed and which they were yet allowed to sow among men on account of this victory of the great queen and on account of her prayers i perceive that the most high injustice set narrower bounds to the demons so that they would not be able to scatter the seeds of error as much as they intended and as much as the sins of men would merit although their sins are the cause of so many heresies and sects unto this day yet they would have caused many more if most holy mary had not crushed the head of the dragon by such great victories by her prayers and petitions i have been informed of a great mystery which affords us consolation in this conflict of the holy church against her wicked enemies namely on account of this triumph of most holy mary and on account of another which she gained over the demons after the ascension of our lord the almighty in reward of her battles decreed that through her intercession and virtue all the heresies and sects of the world against the holy church were to be destroyed and extinguished the time appointed for this blessing was not made known to me probably the fulfillment of this decree is dependent upon some tacit and unknown condition yet i am sure that if the catholic princes and their subjects would seek to please this great queen of heaven and betake themselves to her intercession as being their especial patroness and protectress and if they would direct all their influence and riches all their power and sovereignty toward the exaltation of the faith and the honor of god and of purest mary for this may perhaps be the condition imposed they would be as it were the instruments by which the infidels would be refuted and vanquished the sects and errors infesting the world would be repressed and splendid and magnificent victories would be gained for the catholic truth before the birth of christ our redeemer it seemed to lucifer as was intimated in the foregoing chapter that his coming was retarded by the sins of the world in order to prevent his coming altogether he sought to increase this hindrance by multiplying the aberrations and crimes of mortals this iniquitous pride of the devil the lord confounded by the magnificent triumphs of his most holy mother after the birth and the death of the redeemer the malicious dragon sought to hinder and divert the fruits of his blood and redemption for this purpose he began to sow and spread the errors which after the times of the apostles have afflicted and do now afflict the church the victory over this infernal malice was likewise left by christ in the hands of his most holy mother for she alone could merit and did merit such a victory through her idolatry was extinguished by the preaching of the gospel through her were brought to naught the ancient sects of arius nestorius and pelagius and of others she it was that instigated the zeal and solicitude of kings princes fathers and doctors of the holy church hence how can it be doubted if the catholic princes both of the church and of the state would use the proper diligence aiding as it were this heavenly lady that she on her part would not fail to help them conferring upon them happiness in this life and in the next and cutting down all the heresies of the world for this very purpose the lord has so enriched so greatly as well as the church as the catholic reigns and monarchies if it were not for this purpose it were better that they remain poor 
it was not proper that all the results of the gospel should be obtained through miracles but through natural means obtainable by the proper application of riches but it is not for me to judge whether they fulfill this obligation or not i have only to report what the lord himself has made known to me that those who hold the titles of honor and sovereignty conferred by the church without coming to her aid and defense and without applying their riches toward preventing the waste of the blood of christ our saviour are usurpers and unjust possessors of those titles for in this very thing should the difference between christian and infidel princes consist coming back to my subject i say that the most high in his infinite foresight well knew the iniquity of the dragon and that in the pursuit of his wrath against the church he would bring to disorder many of the faithful striking down the stars of the heaven of the militant church namely the faithful and thus seeking to rouse still more the divine justice and diminish the fruits of the redemption the highest lord in immense kindness resolved to meet this danger that threatened the world in order that he might be moved in this by so much the greater equity and for the greater glory of his name he arranged that the most holy mary should oblige him to give this help she alone was worthy of the privileges gifts and prerogatives by which she was to overcome the world and this most eminent lady alone was capable of such an enterprise to draw toward her the heart of god by her holiness purity merits and prayers for the greater exaltation of the divine power he wished it to be known through all the eternities that he had conquered lucifer and all his followers through the means of a mere creature and a woman just as the devil had cast down the whole human race by another woman and that there was none other to whom this salvation of the church and whole world could be worthily credited on account of these and other reasons apparent to us in faith the almighty gave into the hands of our victorious chieftainess the sword for cutting off the head of the infernal dragon a power never to be diminished in her and with which she defends and assists the militant church according to the labors and necessities of coming centuries while lucifer with his infernal legions invisible forms persisted in his unhappy attempts the most serene mary never looked upon them nor paid any attention to them although by the permission of god she heard the uproar since the hearing cannot be so easily stopped as the sight she took precaution lest what she heard should enter her imagination or interior faculties nor did she deign to speak to them otherwise than to command them to stop their blasphemies and this command was so powerful that it forced the demons to press their mouths to the earth while she in the meanwhile sang great canticles of praise and glory in the honor of the most high this intercourse of her majesty with god and her profession of the divine truths was likewise so oppressive and painful to them that they began to attack each other like ravenous wolves or like rabid dogs every action of the empress mary was for them a burning shaft and every one of her words a flame of fire more dreadful than hell itself this is not an exaggeration for the dragon and his followers really strove to fly and escape from the presence of most holy mary while the lord in order to enhance the triumph of his mother and spouse and confound entirely the pride of lucifer detained them by a secret force his majesty permitted and ordained that the demons themselves should humiliate themselves so far as to ask the heavenly lady to command them to go and be driven from her presence which they had sought accordingly she commanded them to return to the infernal regions there they lay prostrate for a time while the great vanquisher mary remained absorbed in divine praise and thanksgiving when by the permission of the lord lucifer rose from his defeat he returned to the conflict selecting for his instrument some of the neighbors of the holy spouses and sowing among them and their wives the hellish seed of discord concerning temporal interests for this purpose the demon took the shape of a woman known to them all and telling them that they should not disagree among themselves since the source of all their differences was none other than mary the wife of joseph the woman whose shape the demon took held the esteem and regard of all these persons and therefore her words were so much the more weighty although the lord did not allow the good name of his most holy mother to suffer in any important point yet he permitted that for her greater glory and merit 
all these deceived persons should give her an opportunity of exercising her patience on this occasion they betook themselves in a body to the house of saint joseph and in his presence they called forth most holy mary and spoke very harshly to her accusing her of disturbing their homes and their peace this event was painful to the most innocent lady on account of the worry occasioned to saint joseph who had already noticed the increase of her virginal womb and who as she had perceived was already troubled by the thoughts beginning to arise in his heart nevertheless in her prudence and wisdom she sought to meet this disturbance with humility and overcome it by patience and lively faith she did not defend herself nor fall back on the faultlessness of her conduct on the contrary she humiliated herself and begged her ill-informed neighbors to pardon her if in anything she had offended them with sweet and wise words she enlightened and pacified them making them understand that none of them had committed any offense against the others satisfied by her explanations and edified by the humility of her answer they peacefully withdrew to their houses while the demon fled not being able to endure such great sanctity and heavenly wisdom saint joseph remained somewhat pensive and sad and he began to give way to conjecture as i will relate in the following chapters the demon although he was ignorant of the chief cause of the troubled thoughts of saint joseph wished to profit by the occasion for he allows none to escape him in order to disquiet him still more but doubting whether his dissatisfaction did not arise from a certain disgust at his poverty and his lowly habitation the demon hesitated between two different courses on the one hand he suggested a feeling of restlessness to saint joseph irritating and disgusting him against his poverty and on the other hand he tried to persuade him that mary his spouse devoted too much time to her meditations and prayers and led a too negligent and leisurely life instead of exerting herself to improve their poor circumstances but saint joseph upright and magnanimous of heart readily despised and rejected these considerations the solicitude with which he was secretly filled in regard to the pregnancy of his spouse easily smothered all other anxieties the lord leaving him in the beginning to these anxious thoughts freed him from the temptations of the demon through the intercession of the most holy mary for she was very attentive to all that passed within the heart of her most faithful spouse she therefore besought her most holy son to relieve him of these assaults and to be satisfied with the service which he rendered to god in enduring the sorrow of seeing her pregnant the most high ordained that the princess of heaven should still farther prolong this great battle with lucifer he permitted him and all his legions in one general assault to strain all their forces and exert all their malice so that the demons might find themselves entirely crushed and vanquished the heavenly lady was to achieve the greatest triumph that ever was gained or could be gained over hell by a mere creature these legions of wickedness arrived in all their hellish array to present themselves before the heavenly queen and with indescribable fury uniting all the scheming plots of which they had until now availed themselves separately and adding what little they could they advanced to make a universal onslaught but i will not detain myself in describing it specially as nearly all can be understood from what has been described in the two preceding chapters she met them all and awaited their fearful onslaught with the same tranquillity high-mindedness and serenity as if she had been in the position of the highest choirs of the angels seated on their secure and unassailable thrones no strange or improper emotion could disturb the serenity of her heavenly interior although the menacing terrors illusions and falsehoods of all hell were poured forth in torrents by the dragon against this strong and unconquerable woman most holy mary while she thus in the midst of this conflict exercised heroic acts of all virtues against her enemies she was made aware of the adorable decree of the most high that she should humiliate and crush the pride of the dragon by her great dignity as mother of god rising up in ardent and invincible valor she turned toward the demons and spoke to them who is like unto god who dwells on high and repeating these words she added prince of darkness author of sin and death in the name of the most high i command thee to become mute 
and with these legions to cast thyself into the infernal caverns where thy place is appointed to thee and whence thou shalt not come forth until the promised messiah shall vanquish thee and crush thee or until he otherwise permit the heavenly empress shone forth in the light and splendor of heaven and as the proud dragon made a pretense of resisting her command she directed upon him the full force of her power his resistance drew upon him so much the greater pain humiliation and torment since such he thereby merited before all the other demons together they fell into the abyss and remained fixed in its lowest caverns as had happened to them at the time of the incarnation and as i will describe farther on at the temptation and at the death of christ our lord and when this dragon afterwards engaged in his last battle with this queen which is described in the third part of this history this heavenly lady vanquished him so completely that through her and her most holy son his head was entirely crushed in that final battle his strength was so weakened and ruined that if human creatures did not deliver themselves into the hands of his malice they can very easily resist and overcome him with the divine grace then the lord himself appeared to his most holy mother and in reward of her glorious victories he communicated to her new gifts and privileges her thousand guardian angels visibly presented themselves with innumerable hosts of others and sang to her new canticles of praise in honor of the most high and of herself and with this celestial concord of sweet and audible voices they sang of her that which the holy church figuratively sings of the triumph of judith thou art all beautiful mary our lady and there is no stain of sin in thee thou art the glory of the heavenly jerusalem thou the honor of the people of god thou art she who magnifiest his name the advocate of sinners who defendest them against their proud enemy o mary thou art full of grace and of all perfection the heavenly lady was filled with glad jubilee praising the author of all good and acknowledging him as the source of all she possessed whereupon she began to pay more particular attention to the well-being of her spouse as i shall relate in the following chapter of the fourth book instruction which our queen and mistress gave me my daughter the silence which the soul should maintain when the invisible enemies advance with their specious reasonings should not prevent it from imposing silence upon them in the name of the most high and from commanding them to leave its presence in confusion therefore i desire that this be thy prudent behavior when they assault thee for there is no other defense so powerful against the dragon than to be conscious of the power which we possess as children of god and to use the advantage which this confidence gives us by exercising our dominion and superiority over the infernal spirits matthew chapter six verse nine for the whole aim of lucifer after he had fallen from heaven consists in enticing souls from their creator and in sowing the seed of discord by which he hopes to separate from the heavenly father his adopted children and the spouses of christ from their bridegroom whenever he perceives that a soul is united with his creator and in living communion with its head christ he tries to surpass himself in his furious attempts at persecuting it his envy arouses the utmost exertion of his deceitfulness and malice for its destruction but as soon as he sees that he cannot succeed in his attempts because the soul takes refuge in the unfailing and unassailable protection of the most high he weakens in his attempts and begins to writhe in exquisite torments if the soul thus strengthened with the authority of god's truth despises and casts him out there is no creeping worm or ant so weak as that giant of iniquitous pride by this most true doctrine thou must comfort and strengthen thyself when according to the decree of the almighty thou meetest tribulations and art surrounded by the sorrows of death in temptations such as i have suffered for they afford thy spouse the best occasion of verifying thy fidelity by experience therefore love must not be satisfied merely with protestations of affection without looking for more valuable fruit for the desire which costs nothing is not a sufficient proof of love in a soul nor of proper esteem of the good which it pretends to hold dear and love if thou wishest to give a satisfactory proof of thy love to thy spouse 
show thyself invincible in thy trust in him also then when thou findest thyself most afflicted and forsaken by human aid confide in the lord thy god and hope in him if necessary against hope letter to the romans chapter four verse eighteen for he does not slumber nor does he sleep who calls himself the protection of israel psalm one hundred twenty verse four in due time he will command the waves and the wind and restore tranquillity matthew chapter eight verse twenty six thou must be much more wary my daughter in the beginning of the temptations for there is then greater danger lest the soul yielding to the concupiscence or the erasable passions by which the light of reason is obscured and darkened allow itself to be thrown into confusion as soon as the demon notices such a state of mind he will raise a whirlwind of dust in the faculties his fierceness is so immeasurable and implacable that it will then increase in fury he will add flame to flame thinking that the soul has no one to defend and rescue it from his hands psalm 120 verse 11 with the force of his temptations increases also the danger of failing in the necessary resistance since the soul has commenced to yield in the very beginning all this i make known to thee in order that thou mayest fear the danger of being remiss in guarding against the first approaches of the demon do not incur it in what is so important thou shouldst continue the even tenor of thy duties in every temptation keeping up the sweet and devout union with the lord and preserving thy prudent and loving intercourse with thy neighbours thou shouldst forestall by prayer and by restraint of thy feelings the disorder which the enemy seeks to bring about in thy soul end of chapter twenty eight end of book one book two chapter one of the mystical city of god volume two by the venerable sister mary of jesus of agreda this librivox recording is in the public domain book two describing the anxieties of saint joseph on account of the pregnancy of most holy mary the birth of christ our lord his circumcision the adoration of the kings the presentation of the infant jesus in the temple the flight into egypt the death of the holy innocents and the return to nazareth chapter one saint joseph becomes aware of the pregnancy of his spouse the virgin mary and is filled with anxiety as he knows that he had no part in it the divine pregnancy of the princess of heaven had advanced to its fifth month when the most chaste joseph her husband commenced to notice the condition of the virgin for on account of the natural elegance and perfection of her virginal body as i have already remarked any change could not long remain concealed and would so much the sooner be discovered one day when saint joseph was full of anxious doubts and saw her coming out of her oratory he noticed more particularly this evident change without being able to explain away what he saw so clearly with his eyes the man of god was wounded to his inmost heart by an arrow of grief unable to ward off the force of evidence which at the same time wounded his soul the principal cause of his grief was the most chaste and therefore the most intense love with which he cherished his most faithful spouse and in which he had from the beginning given over to her his whole heart moreover her charming graces and incomparable holiness had captured and bound to her his inmost soul as she was so perfect and accomplished in her modesty and humble reticence saint joseph besides his anxious solicitude to serve her naturally entertained the loving desire of meeting a response of his love from his spouse this was so ordained by the lord in order that by the desire for this interchange of affection he might be incited to love and serve her more faithfully saint joseph fulfilled this obligation as a most faithful spouse and as the guardian of the sacrament which as yet was concealed from him in proportion as he was solicitous in serving and venerating his spouse and loving her with a most pure chaste holy and just love in so far also increased his desire of finding a response to his affection and service he never manifested or spoke of this desire as well on account of the reverence elicited by the humble majesty of his spouse 
as also because the more angelic purity conversation and intercourse of the virgin with him had given him no apprehension in this regard but when he found himself thus unexpectedly in the face of this disclosure where the clear evidence of his senses allowed no denial his soul was torn asunder by sorrowful surprise yet though overwhelmed by the evidence of this change in his spouse he gave his thoughts no greater liberty than to admit what his eyes could not fail to perceive for being a holy and just man matthew chapter one verse nineteen although he saw the effect he withheld his judgment as to the cause without doubt if the saint had believed that his spouse had any guilt in causing this condition he would have died of sorrow besides all this was the certainty of his not having any part in this pregnancy the effects of which were before his eyes and there was the inevitable dishonor which would follow as soon as it would become public this thought caused so much the greater anxiety in him as he was of a most noble and honorable disposition and in his great foresight he knew how to weigh the disgrace and shame of himself and his spouse in each circumstances the third and most intimate cause of his sorrow and which gave him the deepest pain was the dread of being obliged to deliver over his spouse to the authorities to be stoned leviticus chapter twenty verse ten for this was the punishment of an adulteress convicted of the crime the heart of saint joseph filled with these painful considerations found itself as it were exposed to the thrusts of many sharp-edged swords without any other refuge than the full confidence which he had in his spouse but as all outward signs confirmed the correctness of his observations there was no escape from these tormenting thoughts and as he did not dare to communicate about his grievous affliction with anybody he found himself surrounded by the sorrows of death psalm seventeen verse five and he experienced in himself the saying of the scriptures that jealousy is hard as hell canticles chapter eight verse six when he attempted to follow out these thoughts in solitude grief suspended his faculties if his thoughts touched upon the wrong which his senses led him to suspect they melted away as the ice before the sun or vanquished like the dust before the wind as soon as he remembered the well-tried holiness of his modest and circumspect spouse if he tried to suspend the workings of his chaste love he could not for she continued to present herself to his thoughts as the most worthy object of his love and the hidden truth of her fidelity had more power of attracting his love than the deceitful appearances of infidelity to destroy it the strong and sure bond which truth reason and justice had woven about her fidelity could not be broken he found no suitable occasion of opening his mind to his heavenly spouse nor did her serene and heavenly equanimity seem to invite him to such an explanation although he could not but admit the change in her shape yet he could not conceive how her purity and holiness could be compatible with any failing such as this change might indicate for it seemed impossible to him to connect such a sin with one who manifested such chastity tranquillity and holy discretion and such united harmony of all graces and virtues in her daily life in the midst of these tormenting anxieties the holy spouse joseph appealed to the tribunal of the lord in prayer and placing himself in his presence he said most high lord and god my desires and sighs are not unknown to thee i find myself cast about by the violent waves of sorrow psalm thirty one verse ten which through my senses have come to afflict my heart i have given myself over with entire confidence to the spouse whom thou hast given me i have confided entirely in her holiness and the signs of this unexpected change in her are giving rise to tormenting and fearful doubts lest my confidence be misplaced nothing have i until now seen in her which could give occasion for any doubt in her modesty and her extraordinary virtue yet at the same time i cannot deny that she is pregnant to think that she has been unfaithful to me and has offended thee would be temerity in view of such rare purity and holiness to deny what my own eyes perceive is impossible but it is not impossible that i die of grief unless there is some hidden mystery beneath it which i cannot yet fathom 
reason proclaims her as blameless while the senses accuse her she conceals from me the cause of her pregnancy while i have it before my eyes what shall i do we both have come to an agreement concerning our vows of chastity and we have both promised to keep them for thy glory if it could be possible that she has violated her fidelity toward thee and toward me i would defend thy honor and forget mine for love of thee yet how could she preserve such purity and holiness in all other things if she had committed so grave a crime as this and on the other hand why does she who is so holy and prudent conceal this matter from me i withhold and defer my judgment not being able to penetrate to the cause of what i see i pour out in thy presence my afflicted soul psalm 141 verse 3 god of abraham isaac and jacob receive my tears as an acceptable sacrifice and if my sins merit thy indignation let thy own clemency and kindness move thee not to despise my excruciating sorrow i do not believe that mary has offended thee yet much less can i presume that there is a mystery of which i as her spouse am not to be informed govern thou my mind and heart by thy divine light in order that i may know and fulfil that which is most pleasing to thee saint joseph persevered in this kind of prayer adding many more affectionate petitions for even though he conjectured that there must be some mystery in the pregnancy of the most holy mary hidden from him he could not find assurance therein this thought had no greater force to exculpate most holy mary than the other reasons founded upon her holiness and therefore the idea that the most holy queen might be the mother of the messiahs did not come to his mind if at times he drove away his conjectures they would return in greater number and with more urgent force of evidence thus he was cast about on the turbulent waves of doubt from sheer exhaustion he would at times fall into a condition of mind wherein he could find neither an anchor of certainty for his doubts nor tranquillity for his heart nor any standard by which he could direct his course yet his forbearance under this torment was so great that it is an evident proof of his great discretion and holiness and that it made him worthy of the singular blessing which awaited him all that passed in the heart of saint joseph was known to the princess of heaven who penetrated into its interior by the light of her divine science although her soul was full of tenderness and compassion for the sufferings of her spouse she said not a word in the matter but she continued to serve him with all devotion and solicitude the man of god watched her without outward demonstration yet with a greater anxiety than that of any man that ever lived the pregnancy of most holy mary was not burdensome or painful to her but as the great lady in serving him at table or any other domestic occupations necessarily disclosed her state more and more openly saint joseph noticed all these actions and movements and with deep affliction of soul verified all his observations notwithstanding his being a holy and just man he permitted himself to be respected and served by the most holy virgin after their espousal claiming in all things the position of head and husband of the family though with rare humility and prudence as long as he was ignorant of the mystery of his spouse he judged it right within befitting limits to show his authority in imitation of the ancient fathers and patriarchs for he knew that they demanded subjection and prompt obedience of their wives and he did not wish to recede from their example he would have been right in this course if most holy mary our lady had been no more than other women yet although there was such a great difference no woman ever existed or will exist who was or will be so obedient humble and devoted to her husband as the most exalted queen was toward her spouse she served him with incomparable respect and promptitude although she knew his troubled thoughts and observations concerning her pregnancy she omitted no service due to him nor did she try to conceal or palliate her state for such evasion or duplicity would not have consorted with the angelic truthfulness and openness nor with the nobility and magnanimity of her generous heart the great lady could easily have asserted her entire innocence and referred to the testimony of saint elizabeth and zacharias for if saint joseph had any suspicion of guilt in her he could naturally have supposed it to have been incurred during her stay with them hence 
through them and by other references she could have justified herself and quieted the anxieties of saint joseph without disclosing the mystery the mistress of prudence and humility did nothing of the kind for these virtues did not allow her to think of herself nor to trust the justification of her mysterious condition to her own explanation with great wisdom she resigned the whole matter into the hands of divine providence although her compassion for her spouse and her love for him made her anxious to console and comfort him she would not do it by clearing herself or by concealing her pregnancy but rather by serving him with more devoted demonstrations of love and by trying to cheer him up asking him what she could do for him and lovingly showing her devoted and submissive affection many times she served him on her knees and although this somewhat consoled saint joseph yet on the other hand it was also a cause for new grief for thus he only saw the motives of love and esteem multiplied and still remained uncertain whether she had been untrue or not the heavenly lady offered up continual prayers for him and besought the most high to look upon him and console him as for the rest she submitted all to the will of his majesty saint joseph could not entirely conceal his cruel sorrow and therefore he often appeared to be in doubt and sad suspense sometimes carried away by his grief he spoke to his heavenly spouse with some degree of severity such as he had not shown before this was the natural effect of the affliction of his heart not of anger or vengeful feelings for these never entered his thoughts as we shall see later the most prudent lady however never lost the sweetness of her countenance nor showed any feeling but merely redoubled her efforts to relieve her husband she served at table offered him a seat administered food and drink and if after all these services which she performed with incomparable grace saint joseph urged her to sit down he could convince himself more and more of her pregnancy there is no doubt that all this was one of the greatest trials not only of saint joseph but of the princess of heaven and that it greatly manifested the most profound humility and wisdom of her most holy soul the lord thereby gave her an opportunity of exercising and proving all her virtues for he had not only not commanded her to conceal the sacrament of her pregnancy but contrary to his usual manner of proceeding he had not even manifested to her his pleasure in any way it seemed as if god had left this whole matter in her hands and entrusted it all to the wisdom and virtue of his chosen spouse without giving her special enlightenment of help the divine providence afforded the most holy mary and her most faithful spouse an opportunity to exercise in heroic manner the gifts and graces which he had infused into them and delighted according to our way of speaking in the faith hope and love in the humility patience peace and tranquillity of these two hearts in the midst of their grievous affliction in order to increase their glory and furnish to the world an example of holiness and prudence and in order to hear the sweet cries of his most holy mother and of her most chaste spouse he became as it were deaf to their prolonged invocations and delayed answering them until his own opportune and fitting time instruction of our most holy queen and lady my dearest daughter most exalted are the thoughts and intentions of the lord his providence with souls is sweet and powerful and he is admirable in the government of them all especially of his friends and chosen ones if mortals would strive to know the loving care for their direction and advancement as shown by this father of mercies matthew chapter six verse five they would be relieved and would not be involved in such irksome useless and dangerous anxieties living in perpetual toils and vain trust in the help of creatures for they would resign themselves without hesitation to the infinite wisdom and love which with paternal sweetness and gentleness would watch over all their thoughts words and actions and all things necessary for them i do not wish thee to be ignorant of this truth but to understand how the lord from all eternity bears in his mind all the predestined of different times and ages and that by the invincible force of his infinite wisdom and goodness he continually disposes and prepares all the blessings useful to them so that the end desired for them may be attained 
hence it is very important for the rational creature to allow itself to be led by the hand of the lord and leave all to the divine disposition for mortal men are ignorant of their ways and of the goal to which they lead in their ignorance they should not presume to choose lest they make themselves guilty of great temerity and incur the danger of damnation but if they resign themselves with all their heart to the divine providence of god acknowledging him as their father and themselves as his children and creatures his majesty will constitute himself as their protector helper and director and he will assume these offices with such love that he wishes to call heaven and earth to witness how much he considers it his affair to govern his own and direct those who trust and resign themselves into his hands if god were capable of grief or of jealousy like men it would be aroused in him at seeing creatures claiming a part in the providing for the welfare of souls and that souls should seek to supply their necessities from other quarters independently of him wisdom chapter twelve verse thirteen mortals would not be so ignorant of this truth if they would study what happens between a father and his children a husband and his wife one friend and another a prince and his well-loved and honored subject all that these do is nothing in comparison with the love which god had for his children and that which he can do and will do for them although men in general believe this truth no one can fully estimate the love of god and its effects on those souls who resign themselves entirely to his will nor canst thou my daughter manifest what thou knowest nor shouldst thou but thou must not lose sight of it in the lord his majesty says that not a hair of his elect shall perish because he keeps account of them luke chapter twenty one verse eighteen he directs their footsteps toward eternal life and keeps them from death he observes their labors lovingly corrects their defects favors their desires forestalls their anxieties defends them in anger rejoices them in peace strengthens them in battle assists them in tribulation his wisdom is at their service against deceit his goodness for their sanctification as he is infinite whom none can hinder or resist he executes what he wishes and he wishes to be entirely at the service of the just who are in his grace and trust themselves wholly to him who could ever measure the number and greatness of the blessings which he would shower upon a heart prepared to receive them if thou my dearest wishes to attain to gain this good fortune imitate me with true solicitude and apply thyself from now on to establish in thee a true resignation in the divine providence if he sends thee tribulations sorrows and labors accept and embrace them with tranquillity of soul with patience lively faith and hope in the goodness of the most high who always provides that which is the most secure and profitable for thy salvation choose nothing for thyself since god knows thy ways trust thyself to the heavenly father and spouse who will shield and assist thee with most faithful love study also my works since they are known to thee and remember that excepting the labors of my most holy son the greatest suffering of my life was to see the tribulations of my spouse saint joseph and his grief in the matter which thou hast described end of chapter one book two chapter two of the mystical city of god volume two by the venerable sister mary of jesus of agreda this librivox recording is in the public domain book two chapter two the anxieties of saint joseph increase he resolves to leave his spouse and he betakes himself to prayer on this account in his tormenting doubts the most upright heart of saint joseph sometimes prudently tried to find relief and ease for his sorrow by reasoning for himself and persuading himself that the pregnancy of his spouse was as yet doubtful but this self-deception vanished more and more every day on account of the increasing evidence of that state in the most holy virgin as this vain and fleeting consolation failed him more and more and finally changed into complete conviction as her pregnancy advanced the glorious saint found no haven of refuge in his anxieties 
in the meanwhile the heavenly princess grew in loveliness and in perfect freedom from all bodily failings her charming beauty healthfulness and gracefulness visibly increased before his eyes all this only nourished the anxieties and the torments of his most chaste love so that his interior was involved by the turbulent waves of his loving sorrow in unutterable confusion and he was finally stranded on the shores of a sea of grief by the overpowering evidence of his senses in regard to the pregnancy of mary although his spirit was always conformed to the will of god yet his flesh in his weakness felt the excess of his interior trouble which at last reached such a point that he knew not any more which way to turn the strength of his body was broken and vanished away not by a definite disease but in weakness and emaciation these effects of his profound sorrow and melancholy became openly visible in his countenance moreover as he suffered all this alone without seeking relief or lessening his sorrow by communication with others as is customary with the afflicted his suffering grew to be so much the more serious and incurable in the meanwhile the sorrow which filled the heart of the most holy mary was equally great yet although her sorrow exceeded all bounds the capacity of her generous and magnanimous soul was much greater and therefore she could conceal her grief more completely and occupy her faculties in the loving care of saint joseph her spouse her sorrow therefore only incited her to attend so much the more devotedly to his health and comfort nevertheless as the inviolable rule of the actions of the most prudent queen was to perform all in the fullness of wisdom and perfection she continued to conceal the mystery about the disclosure of which she had received no command though she alone could relieve her spouse by an explanation she withheld it in reverence and faithfulness due to the sacrament of the heavenly king tobit chapter twelve verse seven as far as she herself was concerned she exerted her utmost powers she spoke to him about his health she asked what she could do to serve him and afford him help in the weakness which so mastered him she urged him to take some rest and recreation since it was a duty to yield to necessity and repair the weakened strength in order to be able to work for the lord afterward saint joseph observed all the actions of his heavenly spouse and pondering over such virtue and discretion and feeling the effects of her intercourse and presence he said is it possible that a woman of such habits and in whom such graces of the lord are manifest can bring over me such affliction how can this prudence and holiness agree with these open signs of her infidelity to god and to me who love her so much if i conclude to send her away or to leave her i lose her most loving company all my comfort my home and my tranquillity what blessing equal to her can i find if i withdraw from her what consolation if this one fails but all this weighs less than the infamy connected with this sad misfortune and that i should come to be looked upon as her accomplice in crime that this event remain concealed is not possible since time will reveal all even if i strive now to hide it to pass as the author of this pregnancy will be a vile deceit and a botch on my good name and conscience i cannot recognize it as caused by me nor can i ascribe it to any other source known to me hence what am i to do in this dire stress the least evil will be to absent myself and leave my house before her delivery comes upon her for then i will still be more confused and afflicted i would then be obliged to live in my own house with a child not my own without being able to find any outlet or expedient the princess of heaven becoming aware of the resolve of her spouse saint joseph to leave her and absent himself turned in great sorrow to her holy angels and said to them blessed spirits and ministers of the highest king who raised you to felicity which you enjoy and by his kind providence accompany me as his faithful servants and as my guardians i beseech you my friends to present before god's clemency the afflictions of my spouse joseph beseech the lord to look upon him and console him as a true father and you also who so devotedly obey his words hear likewise my prayers in the name of him who is infinite and to whom i am to give human shape in my womb 
i pray beseech and supplicate you that without delay you assist and relieve my most faithful spouse in the affliction of his heart and drive from his mind and heart his resolve of leaving me the angels which the queen selected for this purpose obeyed immediately and instilled into the heart of saint joseph many holy thoughts persuading him anew that his spouse mary was holy and most perfect and that he could not believe anything wrong of her that god was incomprehensible in his works and most hidden in his judgments psalm thirty three verse nineteen that he was always most faithful to those who confide in him and that he would never despise or forsake them in tribulation by these and other holy inspirations the troubled spirit of saint joseph was somewhat quieted although he did not know whence they came but as the cause of his sorrow was not removed he soon relapsed not finding anything to assure and soothe his soul and he returned to his resolve of withdrawing and leaving his spouse the heavenly queen was aware of this and she concluded that it was necessary to avert this danger and to insist in earnest prayer on a remedy she addressed herself entirely to her most holy son in her womb and with most ardent affection of her soul she prayed lord and god of my soul with thy permission although i am but dust and ashes genesis chapter eighteen verse twenty seven i will speak in thy kingly presence and manifest to thee my sighs that cannot be hidden from thee psalm thirty seven verse ten it is my duty not to be remiss in assisting the spouse whom i have received from thy hand i see him overwhelmed by the tribulation which thou hast sent him and it would not be kind in me to forsake him therein if i have found grace in thy eyes i beseech thee lord and eternal god by the love which obliged thee to enter into the womb of thy servant for the salvation of mankind to be pleased to console thy servant joseph and dispose him to assist me in the fulfilment of thy great works it would not be well that i thy servant be left without a husband for a protection and guardian do not permit my lord and god that he execute his resolve and withdraw from me the most high answered her my dearest dove i shall presently visit my servant joseph with consolation and after i shall have manifested to him by my angel the sacrament which is unknown to him thou mayest speak openly about all that i have done with thee without the necessity of keeping silent thenceforward in these matters i will fill him with my spirit and make him apt to perform his share in these mysteries he will assist thee in them and aid thee in all that will happen with this promise of the lord most holy mary was comforted and consoled and she gave most fervent thanks to the same lord who disposes all things in admirable order measure and weight for besides the consolation which the relief from this anxiety afforded her she also knew well how proper it was that the spirit of saint joseph be tried and dilated by this tribulation before the great mysteries should be entrusted to his care in the meanwhile saint joseph was anxiously debating within himself concerning the proper course of action for he had borne his tribulation already for two months and now overcome by the greatness of it he argued within himself i do not find a better way out of these difficulties than to absent myself i confess that my spouse is most perfect and exhibits nothing but what shows her a saint but after all she is pregnant and of it i cannot fathom the mystery i do not wish to injure her reputation of holiness by involving her in the punishment of the law yet at the same time i cannot stand by and witness the consequences of her pregnancy i will leave her now and commit myself to the providence of the lord who governs me he now resolved to depart during that night and in order to prepare for his journey he packed some clothes and other trifles into a small bundle having also claimed some wages due to him for his work he retired to rest with the intention of leaving at midnight but on account of the strangeness of his undertakings and because he was in the habit of commending his intentions to god in prayer after he had come to this resolve he spoke to the lord highest and eternal god of our fathers abraham isaac and jacob thou true and only refuge of the poor and afflicted 
the grief and tribulation of my heart are well known to thy clemency thou knowest also o lord although i am unworthy i am innocent of that which causes my sorrow and thou likewise art aware of the infamy and danger consequent upon the condition of my spouse i do not believe her an adulteress because i see in her great virtue and perfection yet i certainly see her pregnant i do not know by whom or how it was caused and therefore i find no way to restore my peace in order to choose the least evil i will withdraw from her and seek a place where no one knows me and resigning myself to thy providence i will pass my life in a desert do not forsake me my lord and eternal god since i desire solely thy honor and service saint joseph prostrated himself on the ground and made a vow to go to the temple of jerusalem and offer up part of the small sum of money which he had provided for his journey in order that god might help and protect mary his spouse from the calamities of men and free her from all misfortune for great was the uprightness of that man of god and the esteem in which he held the heavenly lady after this prayer he composed himself for a short sleep with the intention of departing in secret and at midnight from his spouse during this sleep however happened what i will relate in the next chapter the great princess of heaven assured by the divine promise observed from her retirement all that saint joseph was preparing to do for the almighty showed it to her and hearing the vow which he had made for her welfare and seeing the small bundle and the poor provision he prepared for his journey she was filled with tender compassion and prayed anew for him giving praise and thanksgiving to the lord for his providence in guiding the actions of men beyond all human power of comprehension his majesty so ordained events that both most holy mary and saint joseph should be brought to the utmost reach of interior sorrow for besides the merits of this prolonged martyrdom they would gain the admirable and precious blessing of the divine consolation deserved thereby although the great lady persevered in the belief and hope of a seasonable intervention of the lord and therefore remained silent in order not to reveal the sacrament concerning the disclosure of which the king had given her no command yet she was much afflicted by the resolve of saint joseph to leave her because she reflected upon the great inconvenience of being alone without a companion and a protector on whom she could rely for consolation and support in the natural order for she well knew that she could not expect all to proceed according to the supernatural and miraculous yet all her sighs could not prevent her from exercising the most exalted virtues with a magnanimous spirit such as patience in bearing her afflictions and the suspicions of saint joseph and its results prudence in withholding the disclosure of the mystery on account of its greatness silence in signalizing herself as a woman who knew how to refrain from speaking about that which so many human reasons urged her to make known forbearance and humility in silently submitting to the suspicions of saint joseph many other virtues did she exercise in this trouble in a wonderful manner by which she taught us to hope in the almighty for our deliverance in the greatest tribulations instruction which mary the queen of heaven gave me my daughter the example of my silence which thou hast been writing about should teach thee to use it as a guide in thy treatment of the favors and sacraments of the lord namely that thou keep them concealed within thy heart although it might at times seem useful to reveal them for the consolation of some soul thou must not act upon this opinion without having first consulted god in prayer and then thy superiors for these spiritual matters must not be made dependent upon human feeling which are so much subject to the passions and inclinations of nature there is always great danger of considering that to be an advantage which is harmful and a service to god what is injurious it is not given to the eyes of the flesh and blood first letter to the corinthians chapter two verse fourteen to discern the interior movements so as to decide which of them are divine and caused by grace or which are human engendered by the disorderly affections although there is great difference between these two kinds of affections and their causes nevertheless if the creature is not highly enlightened and dead to its passions it cannot recognize this difference nor separate the precious from the vile 
Jeremiah chapter 15 verse 19. This danger is greater when some temporal or human motive is mixed up with or underlies our actions, then our natural self-love is wont to creep in and take away discretion and supervision of heavenly and spiritual things, leading on to many sudden and dangerous falls. Let it therefore be to thee as a rule always to be followed, that thou reveal nothing to any one except to thy spiritual guide, unless I command otherwise. Since I have constituted myself thy teacher, I will not fail to give thee advice and direction in this and in all other things, lest thou stray from the path appointed to thee by the will of my most holy Son. Yet I admonish thee to appreciate highly all the favors and revelations of the Most High. Preserve them with a magnanimous heart, esteem them, give thanks for them, and put them to practice in preference to anything else, especially in preference to anything originating from thy own inclinations. The reverential fear of God bound me to silence, having, as was proper, such a high regard for the treasure deposited in me, notwithstanding the natural feeling of love and obligation toward my master and spouse, St. Joseph, and in disregard of the sorrow and compassion for his afflictions, of which I so desired to free him, I hid the secret of my state in silence, preferring the pleasure of the Lord to all these, and leaving to him the defense of my cause, Learn also from this never to defend thyself against accusations, no matter how innocent thou mayest be. Oblige the Lord to do it by confiding in his love. Charge thy reputation to his account, and in the meanwhile, overcome by patience and humility, by sweet and kind words, those who have offended thee. Above all things, I admonish thee never to judge evil of any one, even if thou seest with thy own eyes, the outward warrants of thy judgment, for perfect and sincere charity will teach thee to find a prudent evasion and excuse for all faults of thy neighbor. God has placed my spouse St. Joseph as a shining example of such a course of action, since no one had more evident proofs of evil, and no one was more discreet in deferring his judgment. For in the law of discreet and holy charity it must be held as prudence, not temerity, to suspect higher causes, as yet unseen, rather than to judge and condemn our neighbors for faults, in which his guilt is not clearly evident. I do not give these special instructions for those that are in the state of matrimony, since they can derive them manifestly from the whole course of my life. But from the above instruction all can profit, although just now I have in view thy own advancement, because I desire it with a special love. Hear me, daughter, and fulfill my counsels, and follow these, my words of eternal life. End of chapter 2 Book 2, Chapter 3 of The Mystical City of God, Volume 2, by the Venerable Sister Mary of Jesus of Agreda. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 2, Chapter 3 the angel of the Lord speaks to St. Joseph in his sleep, and makes known to him the mystery of the Incarnation, his behavior thereafter. The sorrow of jealousy keeps such vigilant watch in those that are beset by it, that very often it not only awakens them from sleep, but drives away altogether the refreshment of slumber. Nobody ever suffered this sorrow in the same degree as St. Joseph, although, if he had known the truth, nobody ever had less occasion. He was endowed with exalted light and knowledge, so that he could penetrate to the abyss of the incalculable sanctity and perfection of his heavenly spouse. As the reasons which urged him to resign the possession of such great blessing were inexorable, it naturally followed that the knowledge of what he was to lose should add to the sorrow of parting therefrom. Hence what St. Joseph suffered in this regard exceeds all that ever was endured by any man. For no one ever equaled him in the loss, and no one could so value and estimate it. Besides, there was a great difference in the zeal and jealousy of this faithful servant of God, and the jealousies of others in like troubles. For jealousies create in the vehement and ardent lover, a great anxiety to preserve and prevent loss of the loved object and to this anxiety is naturally added, the pain caused by the fear lest the loved one be alienated by others. This kind of feeling or sorrow is commonly called jealousy. 
in those who have disorderly passions and who for want of prudence or other virtues yield to them it usually causes the different feelings of wrath fury envy toward the person loved or against the rival who impedes the return of love be it a well-ordered love or not then arise the storms of suspicion and conjecture in the imagination engendered by these passions the tempests of alternate desire and abhorrence of loving affection and vain regret thus the irascible and concupiscent faculties are in perpetual strife without any regard for the demands of reason or prudence for this kind of sorrow confounds the understanding perverts reason and rejects prudence in st joseph this disorder was not infected with all these faults nor could they find room in him on account both of his own exalted holiness and that of his spouse for in her he could find no fault to exasperate him nor had he any suspicion that her love had been captured by any one else against whom or toward whom his envy might be aroused in defence the jealousy of saint joseph was founded entirely in his own great love for her in a certain conditional doubt or suspicion lest his spouse had not entirely responded to his own love for he found no such strong reasons against as he did for his mistrust a greater uncertainty was not necessary in his case in order to cause such vehement sorrows for in the possession of a spouse no rival can be tolerated hence the chaste marital love of our saint which filled his whole heart was sufficient to cause in him the most vehement grief at the least appearance of infidelity or danger of losing this most perfect most beautiful and delightful object of all his desires and thoughts for if love is in possession of such just motives strong and unbreakable are the bonds and chains with which it captivates the heart and most powerful is the dominion which it exercises especially when there are no imperfections to weaken it our queen exhibited nothing which either in the spiritual or in the natural order was calculated to diminish or moderate this love in her holy spouse but only what tended to blow it into greater flame on many occasions and for many reasons full of this sorrow which had now become an intolerable pain saint joseph after saying the prayer above mentioned composed himself for a short sleep assured that he would wake up at the right time to leave his home at midnight and as he thought without the knowledge of his spouse the heavenly lady awaited the intervention of god asking it of him in most humble prayer for she knew that the tribulation of her troubled spouse had reached such a high point that the time of god's merciful assistance must have arrived the most high sent his archangel gabriel in order to reveal to him during his sleep the mystery of the incarnation and redemption in the words recorded in the gospel it might cause some wonder and such was caused in me why the archangel spoke to saint joseph in his sleep and not while awake since the mystery was so high and so difficult to comprehend especially in the present afflicted and troubled state of his mind while this same mystery was made known to others not while they were asleep but awake in these operations of course the last reason is always the divine will itself just holy and perfect however as far as i have understood i will partly mention some other reasons in explanation the first reason is that saint joseph was so prudent filled with such heavenly light and had such high conception of our most holy lady the blessed mary that it was not necessary to convince him by strong evidence in order to assure him of her dignity and of the mysteries of the incarnation for in hearts well disposed the divine inspirations find easy entrance the second reason is because his trouble had its beginning in the senses namely in seeing with his eyes the pregnancy of his spouse hence it was a just retribution that they having given occasion for deception or suspicion should as it were be deadened or repressed by the privation of the angelic vision the third reason is as it were a sequence of this last one saint joseph although he was guilty of no fault was under the influence of his affliction and his senses were so to say deadened and incapacitated by the sensible perception and intercourse of the angel therefore it was befitting that the angel deliver this message to him at a time when the senses which had been scandalized were inactive and suspended in their operations thus the holy man might afterwards regaining their full use purify and dispose himself by many acts of virtue 
for entertaining the operation of the Holy Spirit, which had been entirely interrupted by his troubles. Hence will be also understood why God spoke to the ancient fathers oftener during sleep than happens to the faithful ones of the angelic law, for in the new law, revelation in sleep is less frequent than direct intercourse with angels, which affords a more efficient mode of communication. The explanation of this fact is this. Since according to the divine ordainment, the greatest impediment and obstacle of a more familiar intercourse and converse of the souls with God and his angels is the commission of sins, even venial sins, or even only imperfections, it follows that, after the divine word became man and conversed with mortals, the senses and all our faculties are purified day by day by the sanctifying use of sensible sacraments, by which men in some degree are spiritualized and elevated, their torpid faculties aroused and made apt for participation in the divine influences. This blessing we owe in a greater degree to the blood of Christ our Lord than to the ancients, for by this efficiency we are made partakers of his holiness through the sacraments, wherein we receive the effects of special graces, and in some of them even a spiritual character, which destines and prepares us for most high ends. But whenever the Lord in our times spoke or speaks in sleep, he excludes the operations of the senses as being unfit and unprepared to enter into the spiritual nuptials of his communications and divine influences. It will also appear from this doctrine that in order to receive the hidden favor of the Lord, men must not only be free from guilt and possess merits of grace, but that they be also in peace and tranquility of spirit. For if the republic of the faculties is in disturbance, as it was in St. Joseph, the soul is not in a fit condition to receive such exalted and delicate influences as are implied by the visits and the caresses of the Lord. It is not at all uncommon that no matter how much tribulations and afflictions increase the merits of the soul, as were those of St. Joseph, the spouse of the queen, they nevertheless hinder the divine operations. For in suffering them, the soul is involved in a conflict with the powers of darkness, while this kind of blessing consists in the possession of light, and therefore the vision of darkness, even if only in order to ward it off, is not in harmony with the vision of God or the angels. But in the midst of the conflict and the battle of temptations, which may be compared to a dream in the night, the voice of the Lord is nevertheless wont to be heard and perceived through the ministry of the angels, just as it happened to St. Joseph. He heard and understood all that St. Gabriel said, that he should not be afraid to remain with his spouse Mary. Matthew chapter 1 verses 20 and 21 Because what she bore in her womb was the work of the Holy Spirit, that she would give birth to a son who should be called Jesus and who was to be the savior of his people, that in all this should be fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, who said, a virgin shall conceive and shall bring forth a son, who was to be called Emmanuel, God with us. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 St. Joseph did not see the angel by imaginary image. He heard only the interior voice, and he understood the mystery. The words of the angel imply that St. Joseph had in his mind already resolved to sever his connection with Most Holy Mary, for he was told to receive her again without fear. St. Joseph awoke with the full consciousness that his spouse was the true mother of God. Full of joy on account of his good fortune and of his inconceivable happiness, and at the same time deeply moved by sudden sorrow for what he had done, he prostrated himself to the earth and with many other humble, reverential, and joyful tokens of his feelings. He performed heroic acts of humiliation and of thanksgiving. He gave thanks to the Lord for having revealed to him this mystery, and for having made him the husband of her, whom God had chosen for his mother, notwithstanding that he was not worthy to be even her slave. Amid these recognitions and these acts of virtue, the spirit of St. Joseph remained tranquil and apt for the reception of new influences of the Holy Spirit. His doubts and anxieties of the past few months had laid in him those deep foundations of humility, which were necessary for one who should be entrusted with the highest mysteries of the Lord, and the remembrance of his experiences was to him a lesson which lasted all his life. 
the holy man began to blame himself alone for all that had happened and broke forth in the following prayer o oh, my heavenly spouse and meekest dove chosen by the most high for his dwelling place and his mother how could thy unworthy slave have dared to doubt thy fidelity how could dust and ashes ever permit itself to be served by her who is the queen of heaven and earth and the mistress of the universe how is it that i have not kissed the ground which was touched by thy feet why have i not made it my most solicitous care to serve thee on my knees how will i ever raise my eyes in thy presence and dare to remain in thy company or open my lips to speak to thee o oh, my lord and god give me grace and strength to ask her forgiveness and move her heart to mercy that she did not despise her sorrowful servant according to his guilt ah woe is me since she is full of light and grace and she bears within her the author of light all my thoughts were open to her sight also that i had in my mind actually to leave her hence it will be temerity on my part to appear in her presence i now recognize my rude behavior and my gross error since even with such great holiness before my eyes i gave way to unworthy thoughts and doubts concerning her fidelity which i did not deserve and if in punishment thy justice had permitted me to execute my presumptuous resolve what would now be my misfortune eternally be thanked most high lord for such great blessing assist me most powerful king to make some kind of reparation i will go to my spouse and lady confiding in her sweetness and clemency prostrate at her feet i will ask her pardon so that for her sake thou my eternal lord and god mayest look upon me with the eyes of a father and mayest pardon my gross error the holy spouse now left his little room finding himself so happily changed in sentiments since the time he had composed himself for sleep as the queen of heaven always had kept herself in retirement he did not wish to disturb her sweet contemplation until she herself desired in the meantime the man of god unwrapped the small bundle which he had prepared shedding many tears with feelings quite different from those with which he had made it up weeping he began to show his reverence for his holy spouse by setting the rooms in order scrubbing the floors which were to be touched by the sacred feet of most holy mary he also performed other chores which he had been accustomed to leave to the heavenly lady before he knew her dignity he resolved to change entirely his relation toward her assume for himself the position of servant and leave to her the dignity of mistress from that day on arose a wonderful contention between the two which of them should be allowed to show most eagerness to serve and most humility all that happened with saint joseph the queen of heaven saw and not a thought or movement escaped her attention when the time arrived the saint approached the oratory of her highness and she awaited him with sweetest kindness and mildness as i will describe in the following chapter instruction which the heavenly lady most holy mary gave me my daughter in what thou hast understood of this chapter thou hast a sweet motive for praising the wonderful ways of god's wisdom in afflicting and again consoling his servants and chosen ones from both the one and the other he most wisely and kindly draws for them increase of merit and glory besides this doctrine i wish that thou receive another one most important for thy direction and for the narrow pathway which the most high has assigned to thee it is this that thou strive with all thy might to preserve thyself in tranquillity and interior peace without allowing thyself to be deprived of it by any troublesome event of this life whatever and by always keeping in mind the example and instruction contained in this part of the life of my spouse saint joseph the most high does not wish to see creatures disturbed by afflictions but that they gain merit not that they lose courage but that they test their own power when aided by grace although the more violent temptations are wont to close the haven of exalted peace and knowledge of god and although they ground the creature more firmly in the knowledge of its own lowliness yet if the soul loses its interior tranquillity and equilibrium it will make itself unfit for the visit of the lord for hearing his voice and for being raised up to his embraces the majesty of god does not come in a storm cloud third book of kings chapter nineteen verse twelve nor will the rays of this supreme sun of justice shine when calm is not reigned in the soul 
if then the want of this tranquillity so hinders the pure intercourse of the most high it is clear that sins are a still greater hindrance to this great blessing i desire that thou be very attentive to this doctrine and that thou do not presume to allow any disregard of it in any operation of thy faculties since thou hast so often offended the lord call upon his mercy weep and wash thyself from thy sins with copious tears remember that under pain of being condemned as unfaithful thou art obliged to watch over thy soul and preserve it for an eternal resting-place of the almighty pure clean and undisturbed so that thy god may possess it and find in it a worthy habitation first letter to the corinthians chapter two verse sixteen the harmony of thy faculties and feelings is to be like that of the music of soft and delicate instruments in which the more delicate the harmony so much the greater is the danger of discord and so much the greater must be the care to preserve the instruments from all gross contact for even the atmosphere infected by earthly tendencies is sufficient to disturb and spoil the powers of the soul thus consecrated to god labor therefore to live a careful life and to keep full command over thy faculties and operations if at any time thou art disturbed or disconcerted in maintaining this order strive to attend the divine light making use of it without fear or hesitation and working with it whatever is most perfect and pure in this i point out to thee the example of my spouse saint joseph who believed the angel without a moment's hesitation and immediately with prompt obedience executed his commands and thereby he merited to be raised to great reward and dignity if he humiliated himself so deeply after having such great though only apparent reasons for anxiety and without even having sinned in what he did how must thou a mere worm of the earth acknowledge thy littleness and humble thyself to the dust weeping over thy negligences and sins in order that the most high may look upon thee as a father and as a spouse end of chapter three book two chapter four of the mystical city of god volume two by the venerable sister mary of jesus of agreda this librivox recording is in the public domain book two chapter four saint joseph asks pardon of the most holy mary his spouse and the heavenly lady consoles him with great prudence the husband of mary saint joseph now better informed waited until his most holy spouse had finished her contemplation and at the hour known to him he opened the door of the humble apartment which the mother of the heavenly king occupied immediately upon entering the holy man threw himself on his knees saying with the deepest reverence and veneration my mistress and spouse true mother of the eternal word here am i thy servant prostrate at the feet of thy clemency for the sake of thy god and lord whom thou bearest in thy virginal womb i beseech thee to pardon my audacity i am certain o lady that none of my thoughts is hidden to thy wisdom and to thy heavenly insight great was my presumption in resolving to leave thee and not less great was my rudeness in treating thee until now as my inferior instead of serving thee as the mother of my lord and god but thou also knowest that i have done all in ignorance because i knew not the sacrament of the heavenly king and the greatness of thy dignity although i revered in thee other gifts of the most high do not reflect my mistress upon the ignorance of such a lowly creature who now better instructed consecrates his heart and his whole life to thy service and attendance i will not rise from my knees before being assured of thy favour nor until i have obtained thy pardon thy good will and thy blessing the most holy mary hearing the humble words of saint joseph experienced diverse feelings for with tender joy in the lord she saw how apt he was to be entrusted with the sacraments of the lord since he acknowledged and venerated them with such deep faith and humility but she was somewhat troubled by his resolve of treating her henceforth with the respect and self-abasement alluded to in his words for the humble lady feared by this innovation to lose the occasions of obeying and humiliating herself as a servant of her spouse 
like one who suddenly finds herself in danger of being deprived of some jewel or treasure highly valued most holy mary was saddened by the thought that saint joseph would no longer treat her as an inferior and as subject to him in all things having now recognized in her the mother of the lord she raised her holy spouse from his knees and threw herself at his feet although he tried to hinder it and said i myself my master and spouse should ask thee to forgive me and thou art the one who must pardon me the sorrows and the bitterness which i have caused thee and therefore i ask this forgiveness of thee on my knees and thou forget thy anxieties since the most high has looked upon my desires and afflictions in divine pleasure it seemed good to the heavenly lady to console her spouse and therefore not in order to excuse herself she added as much as i desired i could not on my own account give thee any information regarding the sacrament hidden within me by the power of the almighty since as his slave it was my duty to await the manifestation of his holy and perfect will not because i failed to esteem thee as my lord and spouse did i remain silent for i was and always will be thy faithful servant eager to correspond to thy holy wishes and affection from my inmost heart and in the name of the lord whom i bear within me i beseech thee not to change the manner of thy conversation and intercourse with me the lord has not made me his mother in order to be served and to command in this life but in order to be the servant of all and thy slave obeying thy will in all things this is my duty my master and outside of it i would lead a life without joy and full of sorrow it is just that thou afford me the opportunity of fulfilling it since so it was ordained by the most high he has furnished me with thy protection and devoted assistance in order that i may live securely in the shade of thy provident solicitude and with thy aid rear the fruit of my womb my god and my lord with these words and with others most sweet and persuasive most holy mary consoled and quieted saint joseph and he raised her from her knees in order to confer with her upon all that would be necessary for this purpose since on this occasion the heavenly lady was full of the holy ghost and moreover bore within her as his mother the divine word who proceeds from the father and the holy ghost saint joseph received special enlightenment and the plenitude of divine graces altogether renewed in fervor of spirit he said blessed art thou lady among all women fortunate and preferred before all nations and generations may the creator of heaven and earth be extolled with eternal praise since from his exalted kingly throne he has looked upon thee and chosen thee for his dwelling place and in thee alone has fulfilled the ancient promises made to the patriarchs and prophets let all generations bless him for in no one has he magnified his name as he has done in thy humility and me the most insignificant of the living he has in his divine condescension selected for thy servant in these words of praise and benediction saint joseph was enlightened by the holy ghost in the same manner as saint elizabeth when she responded to the salutation of our queen and mistress the light and inspiration received by the most holy spouse was wonderfully adapted to his dignity and office the heavenly lady upon hearing the words of the holy man answered in the words of the magnificat as she had done on her visit to saint elizabeth and she added other canticles she was all aflame in ecstasy and was raised from the earth in a globe of light which surrounded her and transfigured her with the gifts of glory at this heavenly vision saint joseph was filled with admiration and unspeakable delight for never had he seen his most blessed spouse in such eminence of glory and perfection now he beheld her with a full and clear understanding since all the integrity and purity of the princess of heaven and mystery of her dignity manifested themselves to him he saw and recognized in her virginal womb the humanity of the infant god and the union of the two natures of the word with profound humility and reverence he adored him and recognized him as his redeemer offering himself to his majesty the lord looked upon him in benevolence and kindness as upon no other man for he accepted him as his foster father and conferred upon him that title in accordance with this dignity he gifted him with that plenitude of science and heavenly gifts which christian piety can and must acknowledge 
i do not dilate upon this vast excellence of saint joseph made known to me because i would extend this history beyond the prescribed bounds however if it was a proof of the magnanimity of the glorious saint joseph and a clear evidence of his great sanctity that he did not wear away and die of the grief sustained at the thought of the loss of his beloved spouse it is yet more astonishing that he was not overwhelmed by the unexpected joy of this revelation of the true mystery connected with his spouse in the former he proved his high sanctity but in the latter he showed himself worthy of gifts such which if the lord had not expanded his heart he could neither have been capable of receiving nor could he have outlived to bear in the joy of his spirit in all things he was renewed and elevated so as to be able to treat worthily her who was the mother of god himself and his spouse and to cooperate with her in the mystery of the incarnation and in taking care of the word made man as i shall relate farther on in order that he might still be more apt and so much the more recognize his obligation to serve his heavenly spouse it was also made known to him that all the gifts and blessings came to him because of her those before his espousal because he had been selected for her husband and those after because he had won and merited this distinction he also perceived with what prudence the great lady had acted toward him not only in serving him with such inviolate obedience and profound humility but also in consoling him in his affliction soliciting for him the grace and assistance of the holy ghost hiding her feelings with such discretion tranquilizing and soothing his sorrow thus fittingly disposing him for the influence of the divine spirit just as the princess of heaven had been the instrument for the sanctification of saint john the baptist and his mother so she also was instrumental in procuring for saint joseph the plenitude of graces in still greater abundance all this the most faithful and fortunate man understood and for it as a most faithful servant was proportionately thankful these great sacraments and many others connected with our queen and her spouse saint joseph the sacred evangelists passed over in silence not only because they wished to treasure them in their hearts but also because neither the humble lady nor saint joseph had spoken of them to any one nor was it necessary to mention these wonders in the life of christ our lord which they wrote in order to establish our belief in the new church and the law of grace for such things might give rise to many inconveniences among the heathens in their first conversion the admirable providence of god in his hidden and inscrutable judgments reserved these secrets for a more suitable time foreseen in divine wisdom he wished that after the church had already been established and the catholic faith well grounded the faithful standing in need of the intercession the assistance and protection of their great queen and lady should draw from the knowledge of these mysteries new and old treasures of grace and consolation matthew chapter thirteen verse fifty two perceiving by new enlightenment what a loving mother and powerful advocate they had in heaven with her most holy son to whom the father has given the power to judge john chapter five verse fifty two let them fly to her for help as to the only and sacred refuge of sinners let the tribulations and the tears of the church themselves give witness whether such times of affliction have not come upon us in our days for never were her trials greater than now when her own sons reared at her breast afflict her seek to destroy her and dissipate the treasures of the blood of her spouse with a greater cruelty than was done by her most embittered enemies in this crying need when the blood shed by her children calls heavenward and much more loudly the blood of our high priest christ hebrews chapter twelve verse twenty four trodden under foot and polluted under pretext of justice resounds in anguish what are the most faithful children of the church doing why are they so speechless why do they not call upon most holy mary why do they not invoke her aid and urge her to help what wonder if help is delayed since we postpone seeking her and acknowledging her as the true mother of god i give witness that great mysteries are enclosed in this city of god and that in lively faith we should confess and extol them they are so great that the deeper insight into them is reserved for the time after the general resurrection when all the saints will know them in the most high 
but in the meanwhile let the pious and faithful souls acknowledge the condescension of this their most loving queen and lady in revealing some of the great and hidden sacraments through me a most unworthy instrument for i in my weakness and insignificance could be induced to attempt this work only by the repeated command and encouragement of the mother of piety as was stated several times instruction vouchsafed by the heavenly queen and lady my daughter my object in revealing to thee in this history so many sacraments and secrets both those which thou hast written and many others which thou art unable to manifest is that thou use them as a mirror of my life and as an inviolable rule of action for thy own all of them should be engraven in the tablets of thy heart and i recall to thy mind the teachings of eternal life thereby complying with my duty as thy teacher be ready to obey and fulfill all commands as a willing and careful pupil let the humble care and watchfulness of my spouse saint joseph his submission to divine direction and his esteem for heavenly enlightenment serve thee as an example for only because his heart had been well disposed and prepared for the execution of the divine will was he entirely changed and remodeled by the plenitude of grace for the ministry assigned to him by the most high let therefore the consciousness of thy faults serve thee as a motive to submit in all humility to the work of god not as a pretext to withdraw from the performance of that which the lord desires of thee however i wish on this occasion to reveal to thee the just reproach and indignation of the most high against mortals so that comparing the conduct of other men with the humility and meekness which i exercise toward my spouse saint joseph thou mayest understand it better in divine enlightenment the cause of this reproach which the lord and i have to make against men is the inhuman perversity of men in persisting to treat each other with so much want of humility and love in this they commit three faults which displease the most high very much and which cause the almighty and me to withhold many mysteries the first is that men knowing that they are all children of the same father in heaven isaiah chapter sixty four verse eight works of his hands formed of the same nature graciously nourished and kept alive by his providence reared at the same table of divine mysteries and sacraments especially of his own body and blood nevertheless forget and despise all these advantages concentrating all their interest upon earthly and trivial affairs exciting themselves without reason swelling with indignation creating discords quarrels indulging in distractions and harsh words sometimes rising up to most wicked and inhuman vengeance or mortal hate of one another the second is that when through human frailty and want of mortification incited by the temptations of the devil they happen to fall into one of these faults they do not at once seek to rid themselves of it nor strive to be again reconciled as should be done by brothers in the presence of a just judge thus they deny him as their merciful father and force him to become the severe and rigid judge of their sins for no faults excite him sooner to exercise his severity than the sins of revenge and hate the third offence which causes his great indignation is that sometimes when a brother comes in order to be reconciled he that deems himself offended will not receive him and asks a greater satisfaction than that which he knows would be accepted by the lord and which he himself offers as satisfaction to god's majesty for all of them wish that god who is most grievously offended should receive and pardon them whenever they approach him with humility and contrition while those that are but dust and ashes ask to be revenged upon their brothers and will not content themselves with the satisfaction which the most high himself readily accepts for their own sins of all the sins which the sons of the church commit none is more terrible than these in the eyes of the most high this thou wilt readily understand by the divine light and in the rigor of god's law which commands men to pardon their brethren although they may have offended seventy times seven and if a brother offend many times every day as soon as he says that he is sorry for it the lord commands us to forgive the offending brother as many times without counting the number and those that are not willing to forgive he threatens with severest punishment on account of the scandal which they cause this can be gathered from the threatening words of god himself 
woe to him from whom scandal comes and through whom scandal is caused it were better for him if he fell into the depths of the sea with a heavy millstone around his neck this was said in order to indicate the danger of this sin and the difficulty of obtaining deliverance therefrom which must be compared to that of a man dropping into the sea with a grinding stone around his neck it also points out that the punishment is the abyss of eternal pains matthew chapter eighteen verse nine therefore the command of my most holy son is good advice to the faithful that they rather permit their eyes to be torn out and their hands chopped off than allow themselves to fall into this crime of scandalizing the little ones o oh, my dearest daughter how thou must bewail the wickedness and evils of this sin with tears of blood this is the sin which grieves the holy ghost letter to the ephesians chapter four verse thirty which affords proud triumphs to the demons makes monsters of rational creatures and wipes out in them the image of the eternal father what thing more unbecoming or hateful and monstrous than to see creatures of the earth the food of worms and corruption rise up against one another in pride and arrogance thou wilt not find words strong enough to describe this wickedness in order to persuade mortals to fear it and guard against the wrath of the lord matthew chapter three verse seven but do thou dearest preserve thy heart from this contagion stamp and engrave in it the most useful doctrine for thy guidance never think for a moment that in offending thy neighbor or scandalizing him in this way the guilt can be small for all these sins are weighty in the sight of god put a damper on all thy faculties and feelings in order to observe most strictly the rules of charity toward all creatures of the most high to me also afford this pleasure since i wish thee to be most perfect in this virtue i impose upon thee as my most vigorous precept that thou give offence neither in thought word or deed to any of thy neighbours and that thou prevent any of thy subjects and as far as thou canst any other person in thy presence from injuring their neighbour meditate well on this as i ask it of thee my dearest for it is a doctrine most divine and least understood by mortals serve thyself with only the remedy against these passions namely with the compelling example of my humility and meekness the effect of the sincere love not only toward my spouse but toward all the children of the heavenly father for i esteemed them and looked upon them as redeemed and bought for a great price first letter of peter chapter one verse eighteen with true fidelity and ingenious charity watch over thy religious the divine majesty is offended grievously by any one who does not fulfil this command expressly inculcated and called a new one by my son john chapter fifteen verse twelve but he is roused to incomparably greater indignation against religious persons who offend against it among these there are many who should distinguish themselves as perfect children of the father and teacher of this virtue nevertheless they cast it aside and thereby become more odious and detestable in his sight than worldly persons End of chapter four